I'm going to be talking on mechanical ventilation expectations from and indications for. So in other words, what does mechanical ventilation do and who should we use it in? There's a paucity of research on the starting point of mechanical ventilation, that is, on the indications for its use. This situation contrasts starkly with the huge body of research at the end point of mechanical ventilation, or weaning. Two factors account for the limited research on indications for mechanical ventilation. First, such patients are extremely ill and any intervention such as careful collection of physiological measurements that delay the institution of mechanical ventilation may be unethical. Second, the nosology of respiratory failure is unsatisfactory, a subject I will deal with in the second half of my talk. With regards to what does mechanical ventilation do, here is a table on the objectives of mechanical ventilation from a review article I published in 1994. I believe the stated objectives remain the same today. That I'm showing you a more than 20 year old table emphasizes how little research there is on ventilation objectives. At the most basic level, a ventilator is used to keep a patient alive while attempts are made to correct the primary disorder that precipitated the need for mechanical ventilation. In a very small proportion of patients, mechanical ventilation is instituted because of total cessation of respiratory motor activity. That is a pure respiratory arrest. Most patients exhibit the opposite end of the spectrum and are making vigorous respiratory efforts at the moment that mechanical ventilation is implemented. A number of investigators have quantified work of breathing in patients experiencing acute respiratory failure. In patients who developed acute respiratory failure as they failed the weaning trial, Amalgia Brown found that inspiratory effort, quantified as pressure time product, increased about four times above the normal value, and the increase was sixfold in some patients. Because of this increase in effort, the respiratory muscles account for a large fraction of the body's total oxygen consumption. In healthy subjects, this fraction is only 1 to 3% of total oxygen consumption. In patients with acute respiratory failure and shock, the respiratory muscles account for 20% of total oxygen consumption and more than 50% in some patients. In thinking at a fundamental level about what does mechanical ventilation do and what do we expect from it, it's useful to undertake a thought experiment of what a doctor might do in the absence of mechanical ventilation. In other words, what would you replace mechanical ventilation with? One, we can decrease airway resistance with the use of bronchodilators. But these generally achieve only a 10 to 20% decrease in resistance, and that will not be enough to obviate the need for mechanical ventilation. Two, we can alleviate the increase in elastic forces in patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema through the use of diuretics but diuretics are not helpful in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema in ARDS. We have no meaningful pharmacotherapy in patients with ARDS. Antibiotics take too long in 
to decrease worker breathing and respiratory failure caused by pneumonia. Three, correction of gas trapping and auto peep can in part be achieved by relief of airway obstruction. But this is fairly limited. Given that auto peep is mainly caused by dynamic airway collapse, the main therapeutic challenge is to raise the downstream pressure and bring it closer to alveolar pressure so as to overcome the waterfall phenomenon. This requires the use of PEEP, which is a fundamental mechanism whereby non-invasive ventilation avoids the need for intubation. I don't see how a pharmacological agent can ever achieve this effect. Four, in patients with hypoxemia caused by ventilation perfusion abnormality, this can be alleviated by a higher inspired oxygen concentration. In a classic study, Moore and Campbell showed that patients with COPD may arrive in the emergency room with PO2 levels as low as 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury while breathing room air. Judicious oxygen therapy can correct this problem without recourse to mechanical ventilation. If the hypoxemia is caused by an interpulmonary shunt, correcting the problem will require recruiting collapsed alveolar lung units. This involves a physical mechanical solution and by a tech compound such as almatrine and nitric oxide, have had very limited success in this area. Five, hypercapnia does not always need to be lowered. Plenty of patients live comfortably at high compensated levels of PCO2, 80 and higher, provided they breathe supplemental oxygen. In some patients with acute hypercapnia, pharmacotherapy is successful in lowering it, as in the case of acute severe asthma or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Six, improvement in tissue oxygenation is going to depend on the underlying cause. In certain situations, increases in inspired oxygen, blood transfusion and vasopressors can achieve large increases in tissue oxygenation without recourse to mechanical ventilation. Seven, protection of the upper airway and handling of secretions requires endotracheal intubation or a tracheostomy rather than mechanical ventilation per se. But once such patients are intubated, it is rare that they are not connected to a ventilator, at least initially. I will now deal with the second and more difficult question in my lecture. That is, who should we use mechanical ventilation in? Consider one of the most common indications for mechanical ventilation, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. At any one point in time, much less than 1% of patients with COPD are receiving mechanical ventilation. This small subset is commonly identified as those in acute respiratory failure, which is usually defined as a BO2 of less than 60, sometimes combined with a PCO2 of greater than 45 or 50. But it's patently absurd to suggest that all patients with a PO2 of 59 or lower need ventilator assistance and all patients with a PO2 of 61 or higher can be managed without mechanical ventilation. The same reasoning applies to the PCO2 threshold. A key tenet of medical teaching is that all therapy should be predicated on accurate diagnosis. William Osler is reported to have said, perhaps only apocryphally, the three most important points in clinical medicine are diagnosis, diagnosis, and diagnosis. The thinking is that diagnosis is the difficult part, and once this has been accomplished, the selection of appropriate therapy is relatively straightforward. The science of diagnosis is closely aligned with the study of nosology and taxonomy, which dates back to Philippe Pinel, 
who is today remembered for removing the chains from the insane in South Petrera. To his contemporaries, Pinel was renowned through his book, Nosographia Philosophy, which was published in 1798 and went through six editions. There are four main classes of characteristics by which diseases can be defined. Syndrome, diseases of structure, disorders of function, and causation. Nosology is rarely discussed at medical conferences. Questions of terminology are regarded as recondite and pedantic, eliciting yawns from the audience. When a speaker is asked to define the clinical entity about which he or she is speaking, the speaker is inclined to appear puzzled, feeling that everyone surely knows what the term means. The audience becomes restless seeing the question as a philosophical diversion that distracts from the hard scientific facts that the speaker is trying to discuss. Readers should treat with a jaundiced eye statistics and surveys such as this one, on which I'm a co-author, which lists precise diagnoses for which mechanical ventilation was used. Authors of RCTs and non-invasive ventilation report patients in different categories using unrealistic and unattainable levels of precision. The application of precise mathematical methods to vague and indefined concepts give them a false air of respectability that cloaks ignorance and perpetuates confusion. Guy Scadding, former director of the Brompton in London, pointed out the differences between essentialist and nominalist definitions of disease a controversy that extends back to the days of St. Anselm and Peter Abelard. An essentialist definition tries to describe what is the true essence of an entity, the essential quality, invariable and fixed properties that makes a given entity the type of thing that it is. In other words, the whatness of an entity. Essentialist ideas about diseases are implicit in everyday speech. Consider a patient who presents with infiltrates and hypoxemia. The doctor makes a diagnosis of ARDS and concludes the ARDS is causing the hypoxemia. Given that ARDS is defined by hypoxemia, the doctor's reasoning is circular and vacuous. A nominalist definition recognizes the task of revealing the essence of the definiendum is impossible. Instead, it simply uses words to state the set of characteristics that are used to identify a member of a class to make a diagnosis. The nominalist essentialist divergent becomes clearer if we consider the definition of acute respiratory failure. Karl Popper condemned essentialist definitions and observed that a good definition in science should be read from right to left, not the usual left to right. So take the sentence, acute respiratory failure is the presence of a PO2 of less than 60, with or without a PCO2 of greater than 50, together with physical findings indicative of increased work of breathing. Reading backwards, from right to left, the sentence provides a nominalist answer to the clinician's question. What shall we call the presence of a PO2 of less than 60, with or without a PO CO2 of greater than 50, together with physical findings indicative of increased work of breathing? Rather than providing an essentialist answer to the question, what is acute respiratory failure? That is, the term acute respiratory failure is simply a handy shorthand for the longer, more cumbersome description. It's nothing more than that. Textbooks in critical care abound with tables listing concrete indications for mechanical ventilation, even specifying precise numerical thresholds as listed here.
The precision suggested by the threshold containing numbers is pie in the sky. The lists are totally misleading. The true indications are much more elastic than what is stated here. So what is the real indication for mechanical ventilation? Most often it is a doctor standing at a bedside who says, I think this patient needs to be placed on a ventilator. An experienced physician can identify a patient who will die if left untreated, but who might live if managed by mechanical ventilation. Even though the physician may not be able to slot the patient into any particular diagnostic pigeonhole. Rather than being guided by laboratory data or some set of numbers, I usually make the decision to institute mechanical ventilation based on subtle physical signs such as the patient's facial appearance, the configuration of the mouth, the presence of nasal flaring, the use of accessory muscles, tracheal tug, recession of the suprasternal face, recession of the intercostal spaces, the presence of abdominal paradox, diaphoresis, and the patient's mental status. Nuanced distinction in the degree to which these signs are present can never be captured in the criteria listed in a randomized controlled trial. Judicious physical examination remains a key skill for doctors deciding whether to institute or not to institute mechanical ventilation. The ability of physicians to perform a highly skilled physical examination has deteriorated over time. To highlight this point, I'll pick one component that is highly pertinent to the field of non-invasive ventilation. In ventilated patients, Marini thought us that by using an end expiratory occlusion, we could quantify the magnitude of hyperinflation in terms of autopeep. 150 years beforehand, the Dublin physician William Stokes wrote a masterly description of dynamic hyperinflation simply based on physical examination alone. He wrote, I shall describe another sign which promises to be of the greatest importance in diagnosis. It is founded on the difficulty of expiration attributed to diminished elasticity of the lung. It then struck me that by making the patient perform a number of forced inspirations rapidly, the lung might be so far distended with air as ultimately to nearly prevent its further expansion. Everything we know about autopeep is listed in Stokes' description. The focus on expiration, the diminished elasticity, the rapid respiratory rate, and the hyperexpansion. The skill that Stokes exemplifies, that of outstanding examination, is communicated only by example, not by precept. This skill cannot be captured in the criteria used for entry into a randomized controlled trial. A skill like this, when it is not employed repeatedly, is lost. I doubt that any physician today is able to perform chest examination with the same level of skill as William Stokes. Otherwise, why did it take 150 years to rediscover autopeep? That level of skill has disappeared just as the connoisseurship in constructing violins at the level of Stradivarius. The current fashion to move from tacit knowledge, as in physical examination, to explicit statements contained in clinical practice guidelines can be dangerous. When developing a clinical practice guideline for the use of non-invasive ventilation in acute respiratory failure, Sinef noted that RCT data support the use of non-invasive ventilation in COPD and CHF, but not in other conditions. Before the guideline was introduced for patients with conditions other than COPD and CHF, 35% were intubated. After the guideline came into force, 100% were 
were intubated. Mortality increased from 21% to 34%. In a shrewd editorial, Nick Hill pointed out that by classifying patients as not meeting guideline criteria, the authors could have encouraged intubation in this subgroup, contributing to the increase in mortality. Don't get me wrong, I'm not recommending a desultory approach to instituting mechanical ventilation or saying that numbers are not important. When I learn that a patient has a sustained pulse oximetry reading in the low 80s and that it's unresponsive to supplemental oxygen, I take immediate steps to institute assisted ventilation. For routine patient care, as opposed to a research protocol, it is dangerous to condense decision-making about the initiation of mechanical ventilation into an algorithm with numbers such as oxygen saturation and respiratory rate at each nodal point. So in conclusion, to return to the first question, what does mechanical ventilation do? It achieves a wide diversity of beneficial actions and I see nothing on the horizon that's about to replace it. With regards to the second question, who should we use it in? Doctors on the ground in the emergency room and in the ICU use mechanical ventilation in patients whom they judge to need it without being very articulate in listing the precise explicit reasons in an individual patient. The harm caused by Stinoff makes me leery of tampering with this process. Our state of research about when and in whom to institute mechanical ventilation is so rudimentary that the temptation of wanting to communicate this information in terms of numbers amounts to playing with matches. Thank you very much.